Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. The swing we did see to some degree among uh, black men for Donald Trump, Mm -hmm. but most specifically a big swing in the Latino population of this country. Yeah, it's it's a big reason we can, I think, say with credibility why Donald Trump won. Yeah. Um, the fact of the matter is, you're right, black men in the end did break largely for Kamala Harris, but she had lower shares of each constituency than Joe Biden did in 2020. And when you put it together, that was enough to be a problem. Indeed. Well, we want to focus more on what's happening with the Latino vote and overall what the future of this administration and potentially uh, the House could look like and turn to Republican Congressman Carlos Jimenez. He represents Florida's 28th district, which includes part of Miami-Dade County, and he also used to be the mayor of that county. Congressman, thank you for being here on Balance of Power. First of all, congratulations on your reelection. If we could just focus on Miami-Dade, Donald Trump just became the first president to win that county, which has a population that is overwhelmingly Hispanic, some 70 percent of the population is Hispanic. He won it the first time any Republican has done so since 1988. What does that capture to you? And do you think that is a permanent switch or just a moment in time? I think it's a permanent switch. I think uh, Hispanics here are moving more and more to the right. Why? Because the Republican Party uh, represents the values of Hispanics. We're people of faith. We're people of family, hard work. We believe in the American dream. Uh, we don't believe in, in uh, oppressive government or gov- over government regulations. Those are the things that we believe in. Uh, and so that's, that's where the Republican Party is, you know, right now. And frankly, the Democrat Party has left, left many uh, Hispanics in their wake as they've gone more left and left and left. Also remember that many Hispanics here in Miami-Dade County in particular have fled socialism. We fled mm-hmm. dictatorial regimes that, such as Cuba and Venezuela. Mm-hmm. And Nicaragua, and when we see uh, the Democrat Party kind of embracing those regimes and also embracing some of their ideology, uh, that's what caused the Democrat Party really to lose so many um, followers here in Miami-Dade County. We've also seen the independents swinging to the right too, and it's this trend has been going on for the last eight years. So walk back with us two weeks, Congressman. Was the whole uproar over? Uh, the bad jokes told at Madison Square Garden, referring to Puerto Rico as a floating island of garbage. You know what came from that. We spent an entire week of talking about garbage on both sides of the aisle. Was that a media narrative? What about the corrosive effect that we all heard that this would have on the Republican ticket? Look, um, Hispanics, we're not dumb. That was, a, that was a bad joke by an idiot comedian in Madison Square Garden, but that's all it was. Mm-hmm. All right. The, you know, President Trump certainly doesn't believe that. Uh, what was far worse was when Joe Biden, the president of the United States, called everybody who supported Trump garbage. That came right out of his mouth. That's far worse than what some idiot com- comedian uh, said in Madison Square Garden. So you didn't Garden. believe so the cleanup had... on that when Joe Biden tried to rephrase that? You, no. You, know, I, you think I heard, he meant it? I heard what I heard. And so, and so did, you know, over 100 million people. They heard what they heard, too. And so the fact that he was trying to clean it up and then he had some people trying to help him clean it up, Mm. that's also an insult to us, okay? Mm. We're not dumb. We understand what he said. We understand why he said it. And so that was an insult to now the majority of the American people, obviously, because Donald Trump not only won the the Electoral College, he also won the the popular vote. And so obviously we didn't believe uh, that retraction as we didn't pay much attention to some, you know, comics, comments about Puerto Rico. They were, it, wasn't, it wasn't funny, uh, yeah. and certainly, you know, it did not reflect our ideals. You know, Puerto Rico, there are great patriots in Puerto Rico. I have uh, a number of friends that are from Puerto Rico. I love Puerto Rico, and so that was just a stupid thing to say by an idiot. So that's what was heard by you and others last week. I'm interested as well, Congressman, in what you heard this morning. The Speaker, Mike Johnson, of course, had a call with members. And I'm wondering what projections you are getting from what is currently the majority leadership as to whether or not it is the expectation that you will stay a member of the majority. Yeah, we, uh, the leader and uh, also all the leadership there expects that we will attain at least 218 and that we'll go beyond that. And so they're pretty confident in, the, in that number. And so... 
you know, what I've seen, nothing that they said, um, you know, gave me rise for concern at this point. Mm. I certainly would love to have a bigger majority. First of all, it's the majority, because the majority in the House is everything. Mm. Even if it's one seat, majority, it's everything. And we need to have the majority, but they're confident that we're going to attain it. And so I will, uh, I have confidence in my leadership, and I believe, uh, I'll leave, I believe that we will be uh, the majority party in the House. Well, before we get to the next session, let's finish this one, Congressman. What's this lame duck yeah. session going to look like? There were questions about, for instance, uh, an emergency supplemental for natural disasters, the hurricanes that we saw. How about the farm bill? What can you get done before the end of the year? Hopefully we can get, get done a lot. I'd love to get the farm bill through. Uh, look, we're going to have to obviously talk to, uh, to the president-elect uh, and, uh, and what the administration wants us uh, to do. But uh, we need to pass a continuing resolution to keep the government open. Mm -hmm. I, am, I, am, I have high confidence we will be doing that. question is, how long? I'd say probably into the March-April time frame. That, that way uh, it gives us enough time, if we're in the majority, to put together the packages that we need to send on to the White House to start turning this, uh, this country around and start implementing the policies of, uh, of Donald J. Trump. Uh, and so, you know, we're going to be working arm in arm hand in hand with the Senate now that we control also the Senate. Look, we now, if we control the House, the Senate and the, and the White House, we have no more excuses. We need to get to work. We need to deliver for the American people. We need to give them, we need to give them a break on high prices. We need to restore our energy independence and energy dominance. We need to restore our place in the world. Uh, and so uh, all those things we need to do and do it quickly. And we have to tackle the long-term problem of our debt. The, uh, well, the national debt is running out of control, and, uh, and our interest payments are higher than our, our payments for, for our expenditures on, on national defense. We need to get that under control, too. Well, I'm so glad you brought that up, Congressman, because as you discussed delivering for the American people, I do wonder, with the debt and deficit in mind, if you think it's realistic to deliver on all of the promises that President-elect Trump has made when it comes to taxes and all of the tax breaks he would like to offer. It is likely to be deficit additive, and I wonder if you think that actually may make it more difficult to work its way through even a Republican House of Representatives. Oh, we need to we need to look at the revenue side of uh, of the house too. It's not just the deficit side of the house. I've always said that it's, mm -hmm. there's two sides to this. There's spending cuts that we have to implement, but there's also revenue enhancements. One thing that the president has alluded to already is that we we have natural resources underneath our feet. For some reason or another, this administration has really hampered our oil and gas uh, exploration and and utilization. We should not only just be energy independent, which apparently we're not right now, we should be energy dominant. We should be using it to help our allies around the world and also to balance the, 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 you know, the imbalance in trade that we have. Uh, and so, yeah, it's going to be uh, difficult to implement all these things, but we need to find the solutions. Look, the, one of the things that the president is really proud of is that when he, he makes a promise, he keeps it. And so he, I'm sure that he's going to you know, come to us and said, I made these promises. We're going to have to find a way to make sure that it doesn't increase the deficit. And I believe, you know, here's what I think will happen. Because of these promises, we're going to have more growth, economic growth. And when you have economic growth, you also have additional yeah. revenue into the coffers, just like what happened uh, during the Reagan era, where we had more money coming in, even though there were some tax cuts implemented by, by the Reagan administration. Yeah, we had a long conversation with Joe Lavornia about that right around this time yesterday, Congressman. We've got just about a minute left. What will happen in the energy market under the Trump administration, knowing that we're already at a record level of production now? How do you compel oil producers to pump more having seen them burn so many times in the past and knowing their penchant for returning cash to shareholders. Yeah, no, look, we need to have a stable energy policy and not one that uh, goes up and down and up and down depending on the administration. And that's something that we're going to have to do with legislation. Uh, the the uh, executive branch hampers production or can increase production simply through the stroke of a pen executive action. We need to make sure that, the, that the, those that are investing in energy production are assured of the long-term investment is going to pay off. What we need to do is actually start to supplant Russian oil and adversarial oil with American oil. You know, 
uh, the Iranians, uh, you know, we, we should be able to put sanctions on Iranian oil, yeah. Venezuelan oil, because those are our enemies, and we need to start sanctioning them so that we, we deny them the funds that they need in order to wreak havoc around the world. That's one of the things I would love to see the United States do. Great to have you with us this week, Congressman. Let's meet up when we're back in Washington. Congressman Carlos Jimenez of Florida, the Republican with us on Balance of Power. We'll have much more ahead on Bloomberg TV and radio. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. It, of course, is two days after the election in the U.S. in which Donald Trump will become the 47th president of the United States, something that was acknowledged today in a Rose Garden speech by President Joe Biden, who shared that he had called Trump to congratulate him on his victory and has pledged to oversee a peaceful transition of power. It was similar in language to what we heard from the loser in this presidential election, Vice President Kamala Harris, who delivered her concession speech at Howard University yesterday. The outcome of this election is not what we wanted, not what we fought for, not what we voted for. While I concede this election, I do not concede the fight that fueled this campaign. I spoke with President-elect Trump and congratulated him on his victory. I also told him that we will help him and his team with their transition and that we will engage in a peaceful transfer of power. Now that we've heard from both Harris and Biden, we assemble our signature political panel. Rick Davis is with us, partner at Stone Court Capital, Republican strategist, alongside Jeannie Shanzano, Democratic analyst and political science professor at Iona University. Great to have you both with us here. Uh, Jeannie, Joe Biden said, we have legislation we passed that's just now only really kicking in. When he spoke in the Rose Garden, he seemed to suggest that we were just getting to the good part as he's now leaving the building. And Democrats are largely blaming him today, fairly or not, for the losses that Democrats incurred on Tuesday night. The, the idea is if he had simply left a year earlier, everything would have been different. Are they right about that? Yeah, it's been sort of ugly to see on the Democratic side, but not unexpected. There's a lot of blame going on. Um, you know, I think Joe Biden does own some criticism for this. Um, but, you know, the blame doesn't fall squarely on anyone, either Joe Biden or Kamala Harris. Um, Democratic Party contributed to all of this. I mean, just one example. When, you know, seven out of 10 Americans tell you they are not happy and think we're on the wrong track, it's probably not a good idea either to run the incumbent at 80 years old or to choose his vice president and hoist her on the American public and expect them to feel differently. So today, Joan Cayley, I am saying that Kamala Harris is looking more and more like Hubert Humphrey, and oh. that is not a good look. No. Um, so, you know, the, and nothing to do with what she's done, but the process by which Democrats did this. It's not a surprise that this happened. Um, and so, you know, we have to think hard about how we move forward. But we know now this is not the way you don't put somebody on a ticket when people are this unhappy without a betting process in terms of a primary. Hmm. But it's not even just about the presidential outcome, Rick. This election bought brought a rebuke of Democrats all up and down the ballot. They have lost the Senate. The majority still has yet to be decided with a few outstanding races, and they very well could have lost their ability to retake control of the House. Well, I think you have to assume that right now uh, the Republican Party is the majority party in the United States. Uh, Senator Hawley said about a year and a half ago when mm. the Trump campaign was just starting up that the Republican Party is the party of the working class multicultural voters of America. And you would have thought he was talking about the Democratic Party from, you know, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I think you can lay the blame all you want. There are obviously plenty to go around, and I feel bad that people go through that because having been the victim of losing <laughs> campaigns, it's never fun. But the reality is there's been a realignment going on since 2015 that the Democrats have done virtually nothing to even abate rather than turn around. And so Republicans really are the working class family uh, party. Uh, if you look at the data, uh, Donald Trump significantly increased his share of the vote in working class uh, 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 counties all across the country. 
But what has also happened, and it's not attributable to any one decision or any one candidate, is that he's made inroads into traditional Democratic uh, uh, constituencies primarily because he was able to show that uh, he could offer another alternative having been president and actually having benefited these constituencies like, you know, young working class blacks, young working class Hispanics. I mean, you know, when you look at it, it's an economic model, not a uh, cultural model that has shifted this campaign. Well, it's interesting, Jeannie, because I'm hearing a lot of people say today that where were you guys for the last year? How come we weren't having this conversation before Tuesday? Hindsight's 2020, right? Everybody's an expert and a political analyst this morning. Uh, but should there have been a more concerted look at this issue? We've been talking about inflation since Joe Biden walked into the Oval Office. How else should we have been looking at this? Well, you know, so many of the assumptions um, are turn out in the aftermath, as you mentioned, Joe, to be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just give you one example. The Democrats were banking on abortion. They were enc encouraging these states to have abortion initiatives on the ballot. And the idea was that you would go into the polling booth, particularly as women, and you would vote for the right to choose. And then while you were there, you would vote for Kamala Harris. And that's not what happened. I mean, it's a good thought. But what seems to have happened as we look at the exit polls is women did what a lot of Americans did, which is they said, yeah, I can do two things at once. I can go for this uh, ballot initiative, support the right to choose. And you know what? Then I can also protect my economics by voting for change and Donald Trump. And so you have both of these things going on. And I think one of the big mistakes that both parties make, but the Democrats made it a lot here, is to assume that because you are a woman or because you are a Latino or because you are black, you think and believe a certain way. And in doing that, they put aside how important the economy is for all voters and how important it is for people not to be feeling like they are getting quite, I'm sorry to say this, but screwed as they go into grocery shop or get gas and everything else. So, you know, people were unhappy with this economy. It impacts all of us. Just because I'm a woman doesn't necessarily mean I cast that aside to save a right to choose. First election since, you know, since the overturning of Roe. So we're just learning some of these lessons, but the assumptions yeah. are dead wrong and it's stereotypes and that's problematic. Democrats do it a lot. <laughs> Well, and it is worth pointing out where while many states that had abortion on the ballot in this cycle did protect those rights, there were states that did not, including in Florida, the abortion amendment That's not right. making the 60 percent threshold in that state, even though it did win the majority of the vote. But that points us to Rick that there were other things on, on the ballot and that they, we did see some split ticketing, including potentially in a lot of these battleground Senate races. We know the Democrats won in Michigan and Wisconsin. We're still waiting to find out both Pennsylvania and Arizona right now in Pennsylvania. We're within four tenths of a percentage point. Dave McCormick up 98% of the votes in. In Arizona, not as much of the vote in. We're moving slower there, 69%. But Ruben Gallego is up on Cary Lake by two points. Is there any chance that the person who is behind right now in those races is going to be able to pull out the victory? Uh, yes, uh, I think probably more so because it's so much closer in, um, in Pennsylvania. Um, as you point out, less outstanding, but 30,000 votes separate yeah. the two. Uh, and so the reality is there's a there's a good chance from what I can tell in the voting patterns uh, that uh, McCormick's got a legitimate shot at being a United States senator mm -hmm. this year. Uh, a little trickier in uh, in in Arizona. Uh, it's all uh, sort of concentrated in one place, Maricopa County. Uh, Maricopa County, we know, takes a while to yeah. count their votes. They <laughs> love to be the center of attention. Uh, Good news this year is there's no reporting of ir irregularities or corruption or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I suspect that once we get a final count from Maricopa County, it'll be a settled case in Arizona. But um, uh, I think there's an outside chance uh, that uh, uh, Carrie Lake could overcome Ruben ba Gallego to, uh, to become a senator, but much less so only because it's a much bigger bogey. 2% oh. of the vote is, yeah. is still, she's lagging behind. And, uh, and she'd have to she'd have to get a, a real big majority over 60 percent of the uh, outstanding votes in Maricopa to be able to overtake that. So that's a heavy lift. Uh, we've seen it happen before uh, uh, and maybe it will come in in sort of the later ballots uh, that uh, that absentees are done. But I would say just one thing. I, I don't think we should underestimate the 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 habit of Trump voters. Uh, to bullet vote, right? Especially the early voters who were, you know, putting it on a ballot and sticking it in the mail. 
um, they, they may or may not uh, vote a full ballot. And, and we've seen this kind of sort of, you know, split uh, ticket voting in the past, although the numbers don't add up, right? There are more votes for president in the state than there are for the Senate candidates. Mm -hmm. We got a statement, by the way, from the Bob Casey campaign in Pennsylvania suggesting we could be headed for a recount here. As uh, they write, quote, yesterday the vote margin shrunk by 50,000. This race is now within a half point. The threshold for automatic recounts in Pennsylvania, with tens of thousands more votes to be counted, were committed to ensuring, as you would imagine the rest of the line here, it ends by saying Senator Casey will be reelected. I don't know how long that's going to take, Rick, but we could be talking about recounts uh, within a couple of days here. Kaylee, we've got a lot more to follow after our signature yep. panel. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano will be back with us in our second hour here on Balance of Power. Indeed. And we also, while we're here on Balance of Power, have to keep track of the markets because this is Bloomberg TV and radio. And obviously, we saw a massive move yesterday, that first day that we knew Donald Trump would be the 47th president of the United States. You're seeing some of those trends continue today. And Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is following them for us. Abigail? It is pretty incredible, Kelly, to see the gains that we do have for the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. That S&P 500 up the better part of 1%. The NASDAQ up more than 1%. So after yesterday's big rally, the certainty that that we're seeing or the rally, the relief rally that we're seeing around the certainty of who the president elect is over the last three days, uh, the S&P 500 up significantly up the better part of 5%. That is the best three day stretch going back all the way to November of 2022. And again, having to do with certainty, but it also has to do with the Trump trade, the idea that taxes uh, may be cut and tariffs and protectionist uh, policy. So when we put this into the perspective, some pockets of that Trump trade may be reversed a little bit today. But yesterday's gains for Donald Trump are really pretty impressive, outshadowing or shadowing, I should say, uh, the 2016 gains, the S&P 500 up 2.5 percent. That's the best day after a presidential election ever. So investors really cheering that. The Russell 2000 up nearly 6 percent, Bitcoin higher. So this is the market's way of saying that they, too, are voting for Donald Trump, that they're happy that Donald Trump is the president elect. 15 handle. On the VIX, Abigail, are we getting a little too relaxed here, too comfortable? Good question, Joe, because about a week ago it was closer to a 22. And at that point you had some investors playing for volatility, playing around the uncertainty, others hedging now, though, not all that uh, nervous, investors not so nervous. What we do have up later today, if you can believe it, I feel as though it's really getting lost in the dust. Of course, the big Fed meeting, it's pretty much baked yes. in, though, <laughs> that they are going to cut by about one quarter of a basis point. It's hard to imagine that they uh, would throw some kind of a curveball. But into that meeting, we do a, see a reversal of uh, yield coming in, also that dollar in. But yeah, that VIX at 15 seems as though investors uh, are back kind of just in the saddle of, yeah. of going along and, and uh, happy. Elbows up on the barrel. <laughs> Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Thank you, Abigail. Reminds us, of course, less than an hour from now, we'll be in our special Fed coverage. Kaylee, not only the announcement, but the news conference, yeah. uh, which I'd be very curious to hear today. I don't know what Michael McKee has up his sleeve, but I suspect we could have some questions about politics. Well, sure, and especially what the political outcomes mean for monetary policy outcomes. Yeah. If we're looking down the barrel of potentially inflationary policy in a second Trump administration, mm -hmm. that will impact, presumably, the trajectory of interest rates. And also, yes. Chairman Powell might have some questions about his job security as he goes to the podium later today. There's a massive question about what the Fed will look like under Donald Trump. Yeah, I thought Trump told us he was going to mix messages. Keep him on board. In the Business Week interview. We'll have a lot more ahead. Andy Smith from New Hampshire up next on Bloomberg TV and radio. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Joining us now is Andrew Smith. He is director of the Survey Center at the University of New Hampshire. Welcome back to Bloomberg TV and radio. Andrew, if we look at New Hampshire specifically, it's a state that Kamala Harris one, there was some question earlier in the cycle as to whether or not a Democrat would be able to win a New Hampshire if it were up for grabs for Donald Trump. But you also had a Republican winning the gubernatorial race. So net net, what does that say about the state? Well, it, it really shows that there is a difference between 
the president and the governor and other uh, elected officials. They're the two people that have to basically be administrators. They're, they're chief of, uh, the chief executives of, of their respective uh, electoral bases. Uh, and New Hampshire has a long tradition of uh, electing Republicans and Democrats uh, in opposite parties to those positions. So if you just go back in the last 20 years, um, uh, John Lynch was a four-term popular governor uh, here, a Democrat, even survived the 2010 Republican landslide. And uh, Chris Sununu was able mm -hmm. to do that. He was a Republican. He was able to survive the uh, Democratic landslide in 2018 here. And so this year we have a, a Kelly Ayotte, former senator, pretty well known and liked within the state, was able to withstand uh, the Trump win at the top of the ticket because she got a lot of that crossover vote from people that liked the way that Sununu governed. And I think governors in New Hampshire tend to govern in nonpartisan ways, much more focused on just making sure that the books balance, uh, the taxes are kept low and the economy is running. Saw some interesting ticket splitting in New Hampshire. A lot of people expected to see it around the country. Uh, Andrew, of course, you know, we base our assumptions on what we saw in the last election, but it actually took place there. Kelly Ayotte, the Republican, former senator, won her race uh, for governor of New Hampshire, even as Kamala Harris won at the top of the ticket. Is that just New Hampshire being New Hampshire? I think there is a lot to be said for that, but you can see this across New England. Mm. Uh, Phil Scott wins again, a Republican yeah. winning in overwhelmingly Democratic New York. Uh, Charlie Baker would win in Massachusetts. Right. Uh, Mitt Romney would win in Massachusetts. So I think there's something that goes on in Massachusetts where you are in New England, where you've got um, more mainstream Republicans, kind of more traditional uh Rockefeller Republicans, so to speak, are able to do well, even though the region and the state of New Hampshire are largely Democratic. Well, so as we consider uh, the, the wider region and the tighter margins we are seeing in 2024 for the victors, uh, at least at the presidential level, when you compare what Biden did in 2020 against Trump to what Harris did against Trump this time around, I, I, I wonder if you think which of those is more indicative of the way things are going to go in the future, I guess? Was it just 2020 was a super uh, high turnout election? There were higher vote tallies in, in total, and that ultimately that turnout is what made the difference? Or does this suggest that we might see more repetitions of 2024 in that the margins are getting tighter and tighter and tighter? I think you could see both. Uh, I, I think actually that 2020 was a record outcome for turnout. Uh, we haven't seen turnout like that. It was even more than the 1960 election, which has always been seen in the in, in the modern times as the, the highest turnout election. Um, I don't think we'll see that again. Remember, that was in the midst of COVID, in the midst of, of, of Trump's kind of uh, uh, Trump uh, was being impeached at that time. A lot of motivation from Republicans and Democrats to get out. This is still high turnout this year, but it's probably more down around the 60 to 62 percent turnout when we get all the final numbers in, which I think is it's high, but more likely to be a typical sort of a turnout as we'll see going forward. Well, boy, there's a lot to consider here uh, when it comes to your view in New Hampshire. I would just love your impressions broadly here uh, as we look at the country. Andrew, you've been in the polling business for a long time and there's said to be a reckoning after every election. And I wonder what it should be this time under sampling Trump tweaking the sample to reach more people who don't have landlines, young people who don't like talking to pollsters. How are people in your industry approaching this new frontier? A thousand flowers are blooming is what I would start off with. Mm. Uh, the whole polling industry has been going through a paradigm shift in methodology for the last five years plus. Uh, similar to what happened in the time between the 1960s and 1970s when we moved from in-person surveys to telephone surveys. Those worked very well until the later part of the, the 2000 and aughts. Um, when we saw response rates really plummet, where we're getting only about 5% response rates in telephone surveys. Uh, that makes them very, very expensive then, and web surveys certainly much less expensive. And since that time, uh, us and many other organizations have been experimenting with these different technologies and figuring out best practices to use web surveys. We're gonna be going forward to web surveys, whether we like it or not, mm. because the cost difference is so great. Um, we, were, we as an industry uh, are going to be looking at this very careful, carefully to see what methodologies were most accurate in predicting the elections, which didn't work, and uh, hopefully be able to have a, a more unified front, I guess, going back, going up to the 2028 elections. 
I should yeah. say that, generally speaking, the polls performed quite well in this election, despite of all the problems that we spoke about. Well, and that's true when you kind of look across the board, not just at the presidential race. And as we look ahead to 2028, I do wonder, Andrew, if ultimately this was mostly about Donald Trump consistently being underpolled, whether that was because of the way voters felt comfortable expressing their support or lack thereof of him or what have you. But I wonder how much of these challenges are unique to this particular candidate who's about to start a second term. That's all he's constitutionally allowed. He's not going to be on the ballot again in 28. Well, I'd say, first of all, um, the methodological challenges that we face in industry are going to continue. Mm. Uh, that said, the undercount or what we would call the partisan non-response that uh, seemed to hide some Republican votes over the last several cycles, that may go away in a non-Trump era. One of the things that I've seen in the research that I've been doing is that Republicans were less likely to do things such as uh, put a yard sign in there in front of their yard or put a bumper sticker on their car because they were afraid their car was going to be vandalized mm -hmm. or even talk about their support for Trump to families, coworkers, friends, whoever. Uh, so there was a reticence on the part of Trump supporters to not support him. And this fits in with a, a, a sociological theory called the spiral of silence theory. Uh, which says that people are less, even less re likely to talk with a pollster, mm. but they're still going to vote for their candidate mm. eventually. So this may be heightened because of Trump, but we may see this going on uh, forward. I think it's something that we as researchers are going to be paying a lot of attention to. Andrew, I mentioned your governor-elect, Kelly Ayotte. What about the governor about to leave the building? Chris Sununu threw all of his chips on Nikki Haley and has been twisting himself into a pretzel in some cases to try to justify his support for Donald Trump. What's in his future, Is it even in politics? I, I think he has a future in politics. He's quite young. He was considering actually running for president himself sure in 2024. Um, and he, he, I think that he's got that in his future to come. Uh, I think the problem that any governor has, any p me uh, party member is, it's very, very difficult to cross paths with the person who's at the top of the ticket. Um, I had an old guy, uh, an old uh, colleague here in New Hampshire who was the chair of the Republican Party back during the, the 1970s. He says it comes down to it. If you're if you're a member of the party, this is your team. You have to support everybody up and down the ticket on your team and, and rationalize it why your skunk is better than the other party's skunk. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you back with us uh, here on Bloomberg. Andrew, director of the University of New Hampshire Survey Center. That's Andrew Smith joining us from the Granite State. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.